Ready, Curtis? Yes, sir. Thank you. I call this meeting of the Conroe Independent School District Board of Trustees to order. Let the record show that a quorum of members is present, that this meeting has been duly called, and that notice of this meeting has been posted in accordance with Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code Chapter 551. The time now is 6 p.m. And we'll get started. Item 1, A and B. Mr. Moore, if you will, please. If you're so inclined, I invite you to stand with me and pray. God of all people in all places at all times, we thank you for the opportunity to serve you and to serve this community. Continue to bless this district, our students, our families, our community, as we all face these uncertain times. We thank you for the educators who are literally learning a new way to practice their profession each day. For the administrators faced with difficult decisions about how to lead in these times. For our bus drivers, our crossing guards, our custodians, all seeking to help keep our children safe. The child nutrition workers. For the warehouse workers, for the financial office, for our legal office, for communications department, trying to get the word out to our community. We thank you for our IT professionals working around the clock. We thank you for human resources specialists trying to fill last minute positions so that there are people in the classrooms ready to educate the next generation of this community's leaders. And of course, we thank you for our parents and our students and the hard work that they put in each and every day to see that these children receive the best education that they possibly can. God, we pray that you would help us lead this district to be a beacon of unity and of peace in these times of division and unrest. God, we pause tonight to remember Mayor Toby Powell and his decades of service to this community, all that he meant to the Conroe area, to Montgomery County, and especially the work that he put in to support the students of this district. We pray for his family and for the city of Conroe as they seek to move forward without him. Almighty God, protect our schools and our children, keep them safe from all harms, and continue to guide our discussions and our decisions as we seek to be the best stewards that we possibly can of this district. We lift our prayers to you in all the names by which we know you. Amen. Amen. Would you please join me in the pledge to the American flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And the pledge to the Texas flag. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Thank you, Mr. Moore. <clears throat> Item two, special uh, district recognition, brief for Better Life Initiative. Dr. No. All right, thank you, sir. Uh, you know, annually we have the opportunity to um, usually bring in a class of children and we would read a book to them uh, as we kick off our Read for a Better Life Initiative. Um, tonight we are not able to do that uh, because of the restrictions that we're under, but uh, at the same time we do want to celebrate reading and um, we are still going to have our Read for a Better Life Day tomorrow in the district, but it's just going to look a little different. And so um, tonight we're going to have students via video are going to read a book. And this book is called Because I Had a Teacher. And it's a, it is a book that we shared with um, all of our staff at the beginning of the school year. And I will tell you, it's absolutely the most fitting time possible to share this book um, with our community. We... Uh, have an unbelievable staff in Conroe ISD. The amount of work that they're doing, the amount of extra effort that it takes to pull off what we are currently pulling off. Um, we, we are one of the largest school districts in the nation that are actually in school right now. And that could not happen uh, without the dedication of our teachers, paras, bus drivers, uh, the list that, that Mr. Moore mentioned, uh, you name it, it, it takes everyone 
working double time and the stress level is high. We know that. We thank you all for your efforts. It's just, um, it's amazing. And so it's the perfect time to hear our students' voices um, lifting up our teachers. And so enjoy uh, because I had a teacher. Good morning. On the behalf of 66,000 students in Connor ISD, we say thank you. Thank you for loving us, believing in us, investing in us every day. We are thankful for our teachers, paraprofessionals, counselors, nurses, principals, assistant principals, child nutrition staff, custodians, bus drivers, maintenance crews, Connor ISD police, and all the district departments and staff that work so hard for us behind the scenes. The reading of this book is dedicated to you all. We hope you know how much you mean to us. Because I Had a Teacher by Kobe Yamada and Natalie Russell. Because I Had a Teacher, I Love to Learn. I discovered that I can do much more than I thought I could. I realized it's okay when some things are harder than others. I found that challenges can be fun. Because I had a teacher, I discovered that there are lots of ways of being smart. And I know that mistakes are just part of getting something right. I realize that some of the hardest things for you make me feel the proudest. Because I had a teacher, I know how good it feels when someone's happy to see me. <laughs> I know that I can always ask for help. I feel like I have a friend on my side. I see that some of the most important things are said without words. Because I had a teacher, I have whole new worlds to explore. I discovered that what I can imagine, I can make real. Now I feel like I could do anything. Because I had you, I learned to believe in me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, teachers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, teachers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, teachers, for all that you do. Yeah, right? Allergies. Allergies. All right. That was outstanding. Very emotional. All right. Let's go. Uh, item 2B, citizen participation. Ms. Goffer, does anyone register to address the board? No one has signed up. Outstanding. Um, item 3, consent agenda. We have one... Um, Request to remove item G from the consent agenda. With that being said, removing item G, I'll entertain a motion to accept the consent agenda with exception of item Move G. to approve as presented, accept item G. Second. I have a motion, properly second. Do I have any discussion, gentlemen? Go ahead. I'm um, sorry, all in favor? Motion passes, outstanding. Now, item G, consider uh, adoption resolution, approving the investment program and the list of qualified investment brokers. I move the adoption of item G. Having a motion, do I have a second? I'll second. We got a second. Any discussion? All right. All in favor? All opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Motion passes. Is that right? One, two, three, four, we go. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Count <down> to two. <laughs> sure we're on the right page there. All right. Item four. Consider adoption of reader for better, better life resolution. All right. We need to hurry up because Ms. Blakelock will present this item. I read what I'm right. Good evening, President Williams, members of the board, and Dr. Knoll. It's my pleasure tonight to come to you right after that beautiful storytelling to ask you to approve a resolution celebrating reading and the importance it has in all of our lives. So with that, tonight before you, um, you have a resolution, and so I just humbly ask for your approval so that all of our district and community can celebrate reading throughout the year. Outstanding. Thank you, Ms. Blakelock. All right, gentlemen. Move approval of the resolution. Have a motion? Second. We have a second. Any discussion? All in favor? 
ocean passes. Thank you. An outstanding job um, on behalf of the district for continuing this initiative. It's always been one that we look forward to um, approving, of course. Uh, item B, consider approval of 2020-2021 targeted intervention plan for Sam Houston Elementary. All right. Dr. Um, Tamika Taylor. Dr. Taylor. Good evening. <clears throat> Sorry. Good evening, President Williams, <clears throat> members of the board, and Dr. Knoll. Tonight we are here to seek your approval for the targeted improvement plan for Houston Elementary. This is the same plan that you approved last year with a couple of minor adjustments, and we are back for your approval on this plan again, primarily because the campus did not get to finish out the entire school year. And as you will see in this presentation, components of this plan proved to work very effectively. Before I start to discuss a little bit about the plan, I would like to note that the school has made progress in the last couple of years, as you will see from the data that we will, will review tonight. And that progress has been under the leadership of some great leaders who are viewing this meeting tonight. First, I would like to acknowledge the campus principal, Viviana Harris. She has been in her role going on four long years at Houston Elementary. Her leadership team consists of two assistant principals, Vanessa Lincoln and Chelsea Fuller. Marissa Hughes is the school counselor. Dr. Debbie Phillips, assistant superintendent of elementary. And Beth Clammer is the school improvement specialist from region six. What you see on the screen is the same data that we've shared with you the last couple of years. What to note is that the campus made tremendous progress in the overall rating from a 54 to 74 progress in domain 2A, which is about the amount of progress the student makes in reading and math in fourth grade, and then progress in domain three, closing the gaps of all the student groups. We also are continuing to focus on domain one, which that domain grew as well, but we are, we are working on increasing that. Great instructional practices were in place last year, and we felt really good about the progress that the campus was making. We did not get a chance to take the STAR test to prove that progress that the campus was making, but we feel very confident. We felt very confident about the progress that we saw based on local data. The campus, like many others, did not receive a rating in the year 2020, and because of that, any campus that was already under school improvement initiatives or is to continue to implement those previously ordered sanctions for the, this school year. So with that, TEA requires those campuses to develop a targeted improvement plan. This is the same plan from last year, and it includes some essential actions that the state defines as essential and effective throughout the state. 5.1 is, is where the campus continues to work on the planning process with teachers, assessing kids, using real-time data to drive <coughs> instruction. 3.1 is where the teachers continue to be proactive with addressing behavior. And the only thing that we're adding, which the campus already does this, but we're adding it to the plan, is for the campus to be able to fill out climate survey, surveys to assess the needs on the campus keeping in mind that we are adding a layer because of COVID and the, the loss of learning for those students. <clears throat> this is just the plan that we are presenting to the state. It is not the only plan or the only things that the campus is working on. Um, the overall needs, like I said, have been adjusted to reflect the lost learning, the percentage of kids that are in person and online and so forth. And we continue to have these supports in place for Houston Elementary. The family engagement liaison is in her third year, and that has been very effective with the community. The positive behavior support liaison is in her fourth year. This is also a, a part of the school improve improvement grant that we will bring back to your attention next month. We continue to train teachers to be content leaders. District administrative support is on the campus weekly, and the campus continues to receive support with content and assessments. And we would also like to thank you for all that you've done over the years to help this campus continue to grow. Thank yes, you. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? No, we're, we're open. We're open for questions. We need a motion and a second. Oh, we oh, need yeah, to approve yeah, the plan. I yeah. apologize. Yeah. So let's let's uh, entertain a motion to uh, approve I the so, targeted so intervention moved. plan. We have a motion. A second. 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 Now discussion, gentlemen. 
Go ahead, uh, Mr. Hubert. Thank you. Sorry about that. I didn't mean to jump the gun. So um, out of curiosity, of all of the successes that you had on there, uh, that's one slide before this, the, the one we're looking at now. What would you say is, the, yeah, this one, the support for Houston? If you had to pick one or two that you see as making the biggest difference or, or has, has provided the most um, benefit, what would you say that was? Well, if I had to pick two, it would certainly be the curriculum support that the district has received. Mm -hmm. I mean, on at-risk campuses, it's not uncommon to have high teacher turnover and teachers that need just a little bit more support with content with that community changing so rapidly with mobility and so forth. So I would say the content support has really been um, something that helped the campus grow because the teachers are able to plan more effectively, use that data, go into classrooms and get support with observations from, from district personnel and so forth. And then the second thing would be the family engagement liaison. We've seen parental involvement just skyrocket at that campus. They went from not having a PTO and limited parent involvement to parent events being packed to capacity. So those two things alone, I think, have aided in the improvement of that campus. All right. Yeah, Dr. Taylor, I, I thought that that's what you, what you were going to say. Um, is one of the things that I noticed on here, that something that I noticed that is not on here, which I think is a, a great thing for the school district and for yourself, is I know that um, not in CISD, but other school districts, when something like this happens and the grades need to come up, they have a tendency to all of a sudden change the demographic of that school right and rezone it that didn't happen here I mean you you brought in all the resources and we as a board supported all resource resources to keep that school together to improve it and to make it better and you guys did a great job so I appreciate that that we kept that community together you guys have reached out to community the parents are getting involved your business owners around around the area are getting involved and that is a testament to how it should be done too yes. so I appreciate y'all doing that and thank you for everything I just have a comment as well, Dr. Taylor, thank you for your leadership. Thank you for all that you've done. Uh, you've listed all these other people, but you have had a huge impact on Sam Houston Elementary and on the students. And I just want to say personally, thank you for all that you do and you have done. And um, I know you've made a huge impact uh, that will last a lifetime for those children that are, are, are you know, being educated at a much greater level. And also, uh, Mrs. Harris, I know that she's been a great leader as well, but I just want to personally say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I echo that, um, Mr. Sanders, but segue to uh, Mr. Huber's question. So we have these resources. My, my concern is, has always been my concern as Sam, is that we understand the position we and how delicate the campus potentially could be relative to um, slipping back. So I wanted to make sure that we are addressing the long-term needs of the campus. So what are our plans long-term relative to resources? Are we fixing the campus, getting it to where it needs to be academically, and to get the community involved with the community liaison and resource-wise, you're comfortable. But long-term, what's our expectation? Well, one of the things that we started with last year, as you will see <clears throat> number three on that bullet, content teacher leaders are trained, and we want the teachers to be just as strong as district instructional coaches in understanding the content, how to teach it, how to monitor it, and how to continue to grow those kids. So those teachers are not only getting trained on the scope and sequence and what the state standards are, but they're getting trained to be experts in the content. <clears throat> I mean, it's, you, you have to know how to teach a fourth grader how to write, right? Sure. So that's just one example of the ongoing staff development that teachers <clears throat> receive. So ongoing. Yes. Sir. Once we get to where we want to be, we're comfortable that the, that the school is operating as efficiently and effectively as far as academically as we want it to be. The resources that you have dedicated to it now, I understand that we won't have an all hands on deck effort as we're trying to get it to where it needs to be, but thereafter, some of the resources that we're essential in getting us to where we should be, um, where are those resources going to be? The, like, are you talking about funding-wise? Or, or I'm or saying your just, campus liaison and the other one or two resources that you... The mentioned. family engagement liaison is, is funded out of the school's budget, but the behavior liaison is funded out of a grant because the campus is in school improvement. So those are some positions because they've worked so well that we'll continue <clears throat> to look at how to fund them. 
Um, and then as far as the district supports, I mean, that's provided from the district. We will continue to support that campus as many others with ongoing staff development. No. So, so long, we're, we're not going to abandon, and I think that's yeah. the question here, is are we gonna just pull all this away when we think we're there? The, the long-term support will remain. What Dr. Taylor mentioned in the beginning is the true long-term um, success there comes from investing in the people so that the, the systems become intrinsic to the building and incentivizing people to stay there and, and be leaders in that building. So when you invest in the teachers, then we will continue to support it from the outside, but the strength now comes from within. And so that's that investment piece that's going on now. The positions that are there, we will not be just removing those. They'll, you know, we, we, we analyze that even as a, you know, they're a C, we, we could have been hopeful it might have been a B next year. They're still going to be a highly at risk school with 80% eco disc. Like that's not changing. I understand. Um, and so all, all of our normal district supports will always be there. And we understand what we have, um, what we need to support there. So okay. it's not going to be, like I said, I think I understand your concern is that we're just going to see, hey, it's a B, let's turn around and walk out and it's going to be fine. Then we're going to turn be right back here in two years with a D. Exactly. That's not, that's not going to be the case. Exactly. And the investments in the teachers, that's an investment, that's a resource. And I understand that's the long way, long term way to go here. But I want to make sure we continue to make those investments in the teachers as we start, as we get more teachers in, as the teachers shift out or whatever the situation may be. I want to make sure that we're continuing to do that, understanding that that school potentially would be at risk. Yes, yes. sir. So that, that, that was my concern. You, you mm. addressed it. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. Thank Go you. ahead, Mr. Husband. Well, I was just going to say, I think the family engagement is, is really the long term. Okay. Yeah. I'm not to take anything away from teacher training and content and, and, and awesome job that y'all have done. But if you engage that community and they feel comfortable being a part of their children's education, then that that is bringing that community together True. and supporting those children and i don't care if it's the uh, uh, the retired teachers or the first baptist church or, or methodist church or i don't mean to take any church out of, uh, or leave anybody off but i mean i know it, you mentioned toby powell earlier i mean the city of conroe has really invested in that school as well and so um i i think that bringing that family that that family getting them engaged is really the answer to the long-term fix because you know if my kid didn't have a teacher they'd still learn because of my wife not because of me i might add. but uh, you know i mean you know they, they they would still learn and so family engagement is where it's at right I, yeah don't laugh uh, you know, i think I you're right on target because it's about it's a, a cultural word. change it's about yes. changing the culture yes of engaging the community and staying engaged with the community and having you know, a leader like Mrs. Harris, who's been there now four years and creating some stability of leadership with Dr. Taylor's help and others to, to really kind of spin it around so that it's not a in and out so much as a, we're gonna, we're gonna create some changes here that are gonna last a lifetime, hopefully. I, I, to my point, I don't know what the civil bullet is or was. Um, I just want to make sure we keep supplying. Okay. <laughs> yes, sir. That, that, that's all, um, that, that was my and, and, and to dovetail that, what everybody said, I agree 110%, but I don't know if somebody's recording or finding out or kind of keeping track of what the success and all of the community involvement, but I would encourage somebody to do that for just mm -hmm. the future, not only of, of the school, but all of our district and how that worked. And so that story can be told years to come. And, and I think it's a success story that needs to be told. Absolutely, and not only told, but replicated, right? Yeah, right? Which is why Dr. Taylor now has a department of school improvement. Instead of just Dr. Taylor school improvement, there's a department of school improvement. Uh, <laughs> so, that we can, so that we can replicate it in other places as well. Exactly. Great. Fantastic. Right. Awesome job. Appreciate it. Thank oh, you. we got a motion. We have a second. motion in All second. in favor. <laughs> motion passed unanimously. Thank you, Dr. Taylor Thank and team. You. Congratulations. Great you. job. Thank you. Outstanding. <clears throat> All right, we're item 4C, consider approval of uh, a synchronous instruction plan for the 2020-2021 school year. Dr. Hines. Read that. Cook that. We tried to get you. We tried to get you. Uh, I don't know. I got my Google on on that one. Yeah. <laughs> Good to see you, Dr. Hines. Good to see you. Good evening. <laughs> All right, man. Hey, President uh, Williams, members of the board, Dr. Noll. Uh, 
Tonight, we are here to ask for your approval of the asynchronous instructional plan for remote online instruction for the purpose of receiving a waiver from the Texas Education Agency for full day funding of ADA, that's our average daily attendance. Uh, to receive funding, just to kind of give you a little background, to receive funding for the asynchronous remote attendance for the 2021 school year, uh, TEA requires that school districts that choose to utilize this model of instruction to submit an asynchronous instructional plan for approval. And um, when we, if we, if you approve it and we send it to the state and it's it approved, then we're able to receive attendance for those students that are not going to be physically present. And that's really um, kind of this process tonight. Uh, the state has two methods that we've been allowed to pick from, from, from terms of remote instruction. They're synchronous, which is real time, plugged in, everybody watching at the same time, going to school all day, but remotely. And that's a challenge certainly on families that means if you have multiple children, you have to have multiple devices, going at the same time, be there all day. Uh, it's very challenging. And then there's the asynchronous model, which is the model that we've selected and brought forward for your approval, which gives us probably the most flexibility of those because it can include some synchronous instruction. It can include uh, all those things. It can also include some self-paced activities or intermittent instruction, uh, pre-assigned work. It also includes working after hours, working at night, as we know some of our students like to engage in the evening. Um, so it gives us a lot of flexibility. Uh, working through our LMS and Canvas. And so uh, we have uh, put together a plan for as asynchronous instruction to bring forward. And just to kind of understand, the state gave us a template. They said, you want, this is the waiver, here's a template, and you fill in the blanks, so to speak. Um, and that's what uh, we've been working on. So for that template and uh, to fill in the open responses, uh, we had a committee put together, uh, several of our uh, district folks and all these folks were selected because of their experiences and worked with online we had summer school that was remote uh, and what we did in the spring so we had some folks work on this and chairing that um, committee was uh, Jeff Fuller and so I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Fuller and let him kind of walk you through the four components of our plan. President Williams, members of the board, Dr. Null. Um, I wanted to kind of walk through a little bit of the plan. And as Dr. Hines mentioned, that we had quite a few experts with us to help develop this plan over a month and a half, two months. So I really do want to thank them because their expertise and their input is invaluable in, in developing this, this plan. Um, so what is, Dr. Hines explained what um, the purpose of this was, was for the funding. TA will use its waiver authority to uh, provide districts with new options for funding uh, de or determining daily attendance. TA has attempted to craft that framework that provides a maximum grace to allow time to transition for the new school year while maximizing that funding. Um, and all these changes that we're looking at right now are only for the 2021 20, school year and anything permanent to that would be passed by legislation. So. Um, Moving on, what are they really looking for? As we work through this plan, there are, there are four components, domains, the instructional schedule, material design, the student progress and implementation. I'm kind of walk through each one of those separately, but after we got through with this, we walked through it ourselves, kind of vetted, vetted it, looked at each domain, said, okay, this is what the criteria is, moved on, and then we sent it to Region 6, and Region 6, who's trained uh, by the state, looked at it and said, you know, it's one of the best that they've seen so far as they've, they've looked at this plan. Um, so the first component, and you have in front of you, I, I do believe the hard copy of that, and I'm gonna take my mask off so my glasses don't fog up here. Uh, but you, you have in front of you the, what the schedule is, and you can see that on your plan, and, and the state says, what do we, we need to do? Well. In order to do that, we have to have a predictable schedule and a sufficient teacher interaction. The state says 240 minutes would go above and beyond that around 300 minutes. Um, teacher availability, such as office hours, are available so that they can conference with the students. Access to instructional support, either synchronously or asynchronously. And, and within that, the IEPs are embedded within the curriculum that's there. And that's face-to-face -face or remote, no matter what. And the engagement is is equivalent to what you would get in a face-to-face -face or direct instruction. So that's the first field that you have. 
the material design that you look at is the second component, and that some that uh, follows up in the um, attestations. And it's these are all TEKS aligned curriculum, and they can be executed in that asynchronous learning environment as well. And they have specifically designed resources and modification to support students with disabilities and our English learners. And you can see some of the things that we have that we purchased, my math lab, the read and write, uh, Seesaw, Adobe Acrobat, Zoom, and our curriculum department, well, our teaching and learning department. Now, it's, they spent a lot of time and effort. They had over 180 teachers write the curriculum to go into this remote learning to ensure that the curriculum was there for them. Um, and there's also within that plan that have live links, if you have it in your eBinder too, you can look at the scaffolds and supports that you have within that for disabilities, students with disabilities and our uh, supports for English learners as well. The student progress component, that is um, feedback from the instructor. They, the state says, what are, you, what are you gonna do? They want at least a weekly interaction. I think by nature of our design, you're going to get almost daily, if not daily, interaction with the teacher by some format. Um, and the grading policies are the same or similar or consistent with the face-to-face -face as they are if they're remote. Um, and the big part of this, the daily trackable student engagement piece, that is where we get our attendance component. That's where we're looking at, are they interacting with the LMS, which is our Canvas or Seesaw? Are they interacting? live via Zoom or um, Canvas conferencing, or are they completing an assignment and sending it in through email, or is the teacher checking in on them, or are they making you know, phone calls, or even phone <coughs> So those are what the state's looking for in this plan. The last component that we have is the implementation side, and there's two pieces to that. One is um, how are you communicating all of this with your parents? Mm -hmm. And how are the, is that supporting the families? Our Conroe ISD website, Dr. Knoll's YouTube channel that he goes out almost on a weekly basis, um, the reopening roadmap that you see, if you look in there, there's, it, it gives you explicit information about what the expectation is of the parent, the student, the teachers, uh, the school district. Um, there's also the technology help desk and community outreach. Also in that component of the implementation of our, is our staff development in our calendar. And there's probably, I think, about 71 pages of a staff development that's been laid out from when we started in the summer until now and ongoing that you can see that support that's through there. There's a live link to that district staff development page as well. It walks you through how, do, how are they working with that in Canvas? How are they working in Seesaw? And how do they teach whatever they're teaching, the curriculum that they're teaching is all in there and it's ongoing for what um, we're, we're asking for for our, our, our students and our staff. So it's a very comprehensive plan and, and we're here tonight to seek your approval on that asynchronous plan. Gentlemen? I'll move approval of the asynchronous Motion, Mr. Second. Moore. Second, Mr. Husband, properly second. Any discussion? Questions? Go ahead, Mr. Huber. Um, you mentioned um, part of the plan is that, that the the teachers have to be accessible. Correct. Which I understand that, but could you talk a little bit more about how often and like is it right now? Well, I can't say now because we're doing the, the kind of implementing other stuff. But the teachers are there during the school day, and the parents and the student has access to that teacher during that time. Does this mean that the teachers now have to be accessible 24-7? No. Good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I can't so imagine. The, so there, and that, that's, that is a, a, could be a real problem because you have some teachers that don't know when to cut off the, the switch and mm -hmm. say, when do I stop and when do I take care of my family? Because most of our teachers are uh, have kids. That's and right. so what is that? Where is it? There's not a, a really a deadline, but the accessibility because we're in this in the situation we're in, they they can tend to to go all night, and so that's something that and could I be a problem. I understand that, and I know that those are personal choices that they make. I mean, my kids get emails and on on weekends from time to time, but that's obviously not required. Okay. We're not asking them sure. to do that by putting this in. We are not asking and setting it up to where a teacher 
now has to be accessible whenever a student or a parent requests. No. But it, but it is also I want to I want to reiterate that we are asking a lot of our teachers, yes, and, absolutely, and and they have we are blessed with an outstanding group of professionals, and uh, this is a difficult time because really it's kind of that and it's a bad analogy, but I said you feel like a wishbone because you've got school going in two different platforms, um, and we're dividing our resources and our energies and trying to make them both work, and as. Um, Dr. Upshaw shared, it is a work in progress. We know we're going to be better two weeks from now than we were this week, uh, and we're going to keep getting better. But, um, you know, there's no doubt that we, we are trying to do everything we can to support our teachers in this, in this challenging environment. Some schools will have set up with separate. We'll have some people running a remote separate from in person, and then some places you're doing both. And, um, and so it really can become a challenge of managing time and managing resources. Uh, we've tried to put things in, in place in our LMS, uh, providing support, um, but, but we're working through a lot of it, and it is challenging to answer your question, and we know it, and uh, right. we're trying to do everything we can to support folks during this time as we transition. Okay. Thank yeah. you. I, I had a kind of a similar concern about feedback for students because I was reading it. looks like a lot of it is daily feedback to the student if it's asynchronous, then that's got to be done during office hours, or that's got to be done emails or phone, or somehow they're having contact with those students. Uh, and and again, I'm I'm concerned about the teacher's time, as well as the student helping them understand and receiving that feedback because I believe that's important. But I was just trying. I was just reading through the information regarding the feedback, and that's a lot. It's whole lot I mean especially if I'm in a high school class with yeah. 35 so, kids it, and some of that feedback comes back just in the form of grading the assignment and that, then um, in addition some of the schools and it's it looks different in different grade levels in different areas but some have created um, you know after hours where there's like a, a, a tutoring person or someone helping a student and giving they're giving them feedback and so we might have somebody available for two hours from three to five or from four to six Okay. It may not be their exact teacher, but it's somebody who can help them with that subject. So it's going to vary okay. depending Good. on the area. But, know. but it is a challenge. I think that's, you know, one of the things about asynchronous is it means not right now, right? So Correct. It, it's, it, and we know we have students that don't even open the LMS until 10 o'clock at night. So, right. Right. Uh, but under this system, it does give them the ability to engage. And, um, it, and as, as Mr. Fuller shared in the slide, the engagement piece is what determines attendance. And so right. you're going to look and you're going to go, why don't we have 100% attendance? We do not. We do not have 100% attendance because not every student chooses to engage every day. Um, but there are those, those ways you can engage. You can engage by turning in an assignment, by actually conversing or interacting with your teacher that day. You can engage by getting into the LMS and, and doing something. So there's lots of ways to do it, but, but not everybody engages every day, which also creates other pressures right now I have to follow up where are you why aren't you working on this so it is a challenge and, and it's I, I think it's a very real concern mr. Sanders that that, mm -hmm. that people are being pulled and and they're having to manage time carefully and I think we're gonna get better at this and right we're, we're learning a lot of ourselves about how we can support our staff I expect it's gonna be great in the long run as well uh, I, as I've had discussions with dr. no I think I think for future I'm 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 the boomer generation so I'm I'm I'm, I'm in the older group but I think for the future generation, this is the way it's going to go and the way it's going to be. I mean, we've talked about college students having opportunities in high school to earn college credit, but they could also be taking remote classes in college. Now they are, but in many cases, but I think it's a great idea. The other question I had was regarding uh, districts, other districts that are doing this. 
what are what and it can be anecdotal but what are you seeing uh are other large districts sticking with asynchronous or that's what i'm guessing they would do it's about 90 10. and then i'm guessing that the smaller districts are probably are doing only synchronous i think about 90 percent about 90 percent of the school districts across the state are doing asynchronous okay it's All right. by far the common model it makes sense that it would be the okay. flexibility of it absolutely thank you my my question is uh kind of concern for the teachers and and the parent everybody i guess but um, if this is two different ways you've got to teach in the same given day okay and let's just take your basic elementary just keep it simple you have five fourth grade classrooms okay mm -hmm and two of them are at home and three of them are at school, okay, 60-40 or whatever the split is. Why do you not have two teachers teaching just online and three teachers teaching just at the classroom and not forcing them to split their time both ways and uh, not necessarily sync? Asynchronous. No, not necessarily all the time, okay, or real time. Maybe async or whatever. Yeah, that that word. But um, I did. I'm just really concerned about the longevity of the teachers to be able to carry this load. Okay, and I also I have another question, and it has nothing to do with that. So I'll shut up and let you answer that one first. Well, let's think about it this way. When you look at reading instruction, there's different parts of reading. There's the small group guided reading. There's the mini lesson. It's a 90-minute block of instruction. The teacher can actually be doing, and you'll see it. So what you'll see is different successes. The ones that are doing where President Williams would be teaching live and I'd be teaching in person. And then the teacher that's teaching the mini lesson, here are her kids, she's on the camera, she's live watching her children. Kids are zoomed on the screen, and she's doing it both at the same time. So what the difference is, is that we are trying to teach our teachers you don't have to do everything twice. You can engage live for certain portions of the day. What we don't think is reasonable for our kids and why we chose this plan is for children to sit seven hours during the day. Yeah. It's not good for any child to be at a computer for seven hours. Right. So you, we've, we've created curriculum that is the most highly, highly needed teaks in that grade level and said these are the ones you highlight in the live instruction or then bring your kids to small groups. Yeah, I, I can answer your question. Okay. But, okay. Because yeah, that didn't you. answer my no, question. No, I'm going to answer that, for you. That's what you're doing. Yeah, that's not I'm going to answer for you. Okay. So if you have 100 kids in, and, and, and everybody's doing it different ways, there. right? So let's say you have uh, uh, 100 kids and 40 are at home, 60 are there. If those three, if three teachers are teaching those that are there, you have 20 children in every class. Right. Which 20 small children in a class might sound reasonable. Um, but if all five of those teachers were teaching, now you only have 12 children in each class. So you have much more social distancing. Yeah. The elementary example is, is a little different because when you get to high school, it's a whole other thing because they typically have 30, 32 kids in a class. So a lot of this has to do with trying to protect our teachers okay. to not put 32 okay. high school kids in a class, but to try to drop that class to 20 and spread it out. Okay. That, that's... I, I, I still stand by my statement, though, that I, I don't know how, I mean, I disagree, and maybe I misunderstood. I don't think this is a good idea. It's a different, it, it's a different thing at college. They're already socialized, and you can, you know, I had one take a, take a degree online, 100% online. But they already have their friends. They already know how to socialize. They already you know, that learned all those lessons the hard way sometimes, but whatever they learned, okay? But I disagree that this is a good idea for us long term. And I mean, some of it may go that way. I, I'm not going to stop, you know, technology or whatever or change. But uh, I really think these kids need each other as much as, it, it, or if not more, they need the teachers. But okay, so my second question is good answer. I understand that and, and splitting up the kids even further. But this happened in my office. Ladies taking a four day holiday this week. Her kids started school in in school. She's taking them out. 
she's taking them on this vacation. See, they've been cooped up all this summer, right? So they're now that they can take a vacation, they want to take a vacation, but their kids are back in school. So they're they're switching in and out of at home or in school. Do you understand what I'm trying yes. to say? Yes. I, maybe yes. I didn't do a good job of it. No, I do we allow it one and what I, I, I don't really see how that how they're going to yeah so complete a school year how I mean, I'm, I'm talking about the child learning something not whether we get counted you know uh, water or not yeah the, the second advantage to the teaching in dual platforms is it does allow for this flow back and forth so where we have uh, where we have campuses that have a set number of online teachers and a set number of in-person teachers. Uh, what we experienced in the last two weeks is we've experienced thousands of families that told us they wanted online and they switched. And but so- that's a one-time switch. Yeah, that's a one-time switch. And so, but, but that's created that problem. So that's the, I just wanna give you that the second reason why that's a challenge. Okay. But so yes, the state does allow us anytime a child is absent to allow them to become they can be remote that day and still be counted present. And the reason TEA put that in is because they didn't want children to be encouraged to come to school when they were sick, sick right? So you, you, they still have the 90% attendance rule. So if you, they're trying to not incentivize attending school when you're sick. So in the example, like all of our high schools are, where they're t the teacher is teaching in both platforms, if I'm sick today, or if I'm on vacation, but they'll probably tell us they're sick. Um, uh, then yes, I, I may not attend class today, but I can log into Canvas and still do my work. Yeah. I still get my work done and I can still be counted present okay. for that day. Y'all have done an extremely good job of answering all my questions. I'm glad they explained it because you're about to run somebody off. <laughs> <laughs> But, but I, I am I'm still concerned about the, 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 the ability of our teachers to hold up to this schedule. I mean because you know as well as I do, it's just like them providing pencils uh, out of their own pocket. If the kid needs help at 8 o'clock at night, they're going to help him at 8 o'clock at night. You would. True. I would. Absolutely. I mean, you know, and I'm not even a teacher. Yeah, but they you don't it. want me helping them. But anyway, but, you know, I'm, I'm really concerned about them. And, and I don't know that that's answerable. But we echo. I'm not I mean, asking you to answer. We, we agree. I think that's the yeah. bottom line. And every yeah. principal we talk to is in the same place. It's. I mean, I saw, I saw Wayne Mack online say, you know, our teachers right now, they don't need advi your advice. They just need your support. <laughs> right. Because yeah. that's well, all they need right now is in prayer. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. anyway, thank you. All right. If, if I could, I, just to come full circle as to what, what you're asking for, because we've had a lot of conversation, mm -hmm. would you just reiterate this, this plan, we need to, this is coming to us for adoption because in order for us to get full funding from the state of Texas, we need to adopt a plan. So this whether or not this is a long-term plan, this is what we have right yeah, now. It's for, We're it's, already putting this it's in. It's for funding purposes, but really what it is is it's to allow us to have online school. Without, right. without approving this plan, we would be contacting 20,000 families saying, you now have to return face-to-face -face whether you want to or not. Right. We, we, can't, we have not been approved by the state of Texas to be a virtual instructor for this year and and to be clear as, as uh, mr fuller mentioned we don't there is no mechanism in the state of texas for this to be a long-term thing right the legislature would have to change the laws to allow us to have online they've never allowed us to have online education in the past and there is no mechanism for them to allow us to have it in the future this is a one-year only proposition so that's what we're asking for is your approval for the plan because they let us start the plan early, but if we don't get a plan in and get it approved, then we're not an approved online right. school district, and those kids got to come back. And, and I will add as a caveat that they could ask us to tweak it. It is yes. a negotiated process, so we will submit it, and they, they do have the ability to say, hey, right. we like it, but change this or change that. Very good. Gentlemen, we got a motion second. We had a discussion. Any further discussion? All in favor? Motion passed. Thank you, Mr. Fuller. Appreciate you. Thank you. Dr. Upshaw, team. All right, uh, item five, administration, administration, consider granting a authorization to submit a missed day school waiver to the uh, TEA. All right, Dr. Hines. Good evening again. Uh, thank you very much. We are asking you tonight to approve uh, a waiver uh, for a missed school day. Um, 
as you know and you're aware, uh, we were closed August 26th and 27th mm -hmm. due to the threat of a Hurricane Laura. We remained closed on Friday, August the 28th, due to the widespread power outages. And our calendar that you approved uh, last spring uh, builds in enough minutes for two makeup days. And so the first two makeup days we have in our calendar. Um, the third day will require us uh, to apply for this missed school day waiver. And so we ask for your approval so we do not have to make up that day. I move we approve. I second. I have some questions though. All right, motion, second, discussion. Gentlemen, go ahead. So it's always fun to uh, use all your days before you even get to <laughs> any holidays. It's happened to us before. My yes. question is, um, does it make sense to ask for more than just one day at this point so we don't have to later on? So the way I understand it is we'll have to come back again. Yeah. And so it's it's an on, ongoing process. Mm -hmm. So we're just it's not like we're locked at only one. No, I understand. I understand. But we already have our calendar, as you said, had two days built in already. We Would are required to just, use those two days. We have to first. We have to use them before we can ask for this waiver. Thank you. Okay. So you indeed. I'm sorry. I wasn't answering it. All right. All in favor? Motion passes. Thank you, Dr. Hines. Item B, receive update regarding uh, attendance zone for elementary schools and the Caney Creek feeder. All right. Dr. Dr. Hines. Um. Again, good evening, President Williams, members of the board, Dr. Null. Uh, it is that uh, time of the year that we begin to look at uh, zoning for new schools. And so when are we, we voting on this? <laughs> You're in good shape. <laughs> 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 yeah. Mr. Kidd, yeah. next month. Yeah. Just to kind of give everybody the... Oh, the Caught up, we will be opening a school of uh, approximately population of 950 students in August of 2021. That's Reuben W. Hope Junior Elementary School. It will serve students in grades pre-K through four. It will be located at 14755 Granger Pines Way in the Granger Pines development. And so this is just a real quick reminder of what the rendering, what it should look like when we're done. There's the actual location in the uh, yellow road up there is 3083. And so it's on the south side of 38.3. You can see the main driveway coming into the neighborhood. Um, this is kind of a, an aerial uh, photo of the, the school as it lays out coming into the neighborhood. It's right there on the left. So if you drive out there, you won't miss it when you turn in. It's right there. Uh, it's coming along nicely. I know Mr. Foster will share more, and he's actually the provider of today's pictures. Uh, and this is another <coughs> image um, from a different angle of the school on the site so we as you know we have to do boundary adjustments when we open new schools and when sometimes we just have to move around uh, to, to make better use of our available space at schools and on September 14th our enrollment was 64,360 students we ended the year with enrollment of 64,067 students so we're currently just under 2,000 of what we projected as we know a lot of that's related to the COVID um, our, pro our projections for grade one and down it, uh, really accounts for 1,100 of that 2,000. So we know we're missing a lot of those uh, pre-K, K, PPCD students. Um, so we're beginning this because we know we need the space. Uh, Austin Elementary is a capacity of roughly 900 students. And I've always, I always give you the disclaimer, you know, uh, capacity of a building is a moving target because mm -hmm. of programs. And, mm -hmm. and we never, it, it can change from year to year. 50, 60 students. Uh, and we also remember when we added full day pre-K, we, we essentially uh, reduced our capacity of our buildings because we're now using a room all day when we were using it for two classes. Uh, so Austin is currently at nine, uh, has room for 900. We just did the addition last year of the new, the new building, essentially to replace the 50s part of it. And it has uh, 966 students with 11 portable classrooms. In 2028, they're projected to be at 1,551. So we know we've got to make some room for Austin. Creighton Elementary is also crowded. It has a capacity of 675 students. It ended the year with 815 students last year. It has 10 portable classrooms. In 2028, they're projected to be at 1,058 students. So we know there's growth in the Creighton area. And then, of course, that 242 corridor that we're all familiar with, there's uh, several developments planned in that area, which would impact San Jacinto Elementary. San Jacinto concluded uh, with 2020 with 620 students. It has capacity for roughly 750 students. 
In 2028, San Jacinto is projected to have an enrollment of 1,296 students. So those three schools are facing some growth in the next several years. Um, we also are including in the process Patterson Elementary, and, um, which finished with an enrollment of 948 with a capacity of 925 students. They currently have two portables. We, we really, at this point, I'm not really uh, sure we're interested in bringing anybody out of Patterson, but I did want to highlight in our map those are two areas. Um, the salmon color is an area that currently is zoned to Austin, but that blue, that dark blue line represents the Bosman attendance boundary. And so those students actually go to Austin for elementary and then they switch over to Bosman. We may not, because Patterson's at capacity, we probably do not have room to bring that group of students back at this time, but it's certainly something that we might be able to address when we open the new school in the Conroe area in 2022 so um, that's something we will have on our um, radar that we'll keep an eye on the area with the lines running through it that represents an area that used to go to Austin that we brought over to Patterson to deal with Austin crowding uh, about three years ago and we've tried not to move <coughs> uh, that quickly an area back and forth because that means the students would have been in three schools in four years so <coughs> we're, we try to be mindful of that and that's really why I highlighted it for our committee so uh, we'll try to not move that area um, and then this is just kind of what I call the box score of where we are with uh, the year they were built the capacity how many portables are on site and then uh, where we are uh, where we where we finished last year uh, where we are today and where we think we're going to be in 2028 and certainly um, as we know with projections sometimes they happen faster sometimes they happen later but they generally we get there so these are our projections um, we know this is a challenging process because schools are communities. Families often have a history of going to a particular school, and they often select where they live to go to a school. And so we know this is not uh, an easy process. Um, our objective is very similar to the past. Really, for for Hope Elementary, is we want to we want to give a, an attendance boundary that will populate the school. We want to leave some room at that school for growth. We also want to relieve crowding at Austin, Creighton, and San Jacinto Elementary School. So that's how we'll know if we're successful. We will reduce uh, the enrollments at all of those schools. Um, we are projected to have 4,020 students in the Caney Creek Elementary feeder in 2025. We will have, after Hope uh, opens, 4,175 seats. Um, and so that'll give us capacity through, we know through 2025. And then, as I mentioned earlier, by the time we get to 2028, we're looking at a projection of 4815, which which translates to mean we're going to need another school in the Caney Creek feeder zone probably five years, six years from now at the, at the latest. Um, and that is in this bond package. So um, it is something that we have to be ready for. So I just want to bring that up. To do this, we'll have a committee. Uh, we have, we'll have our first kind of our district part of this committee meet this week, and then our whole committee will meet the following week. Um, and we do have our goals, and again, I won't read those. I know you've seen them many times, uh, but certainly uh, we want to meet and uh, come up with scenarios and have a process to get some public feedback and then bring you our recommendations. We hope to be back probably in November to give you an update, and then again in January to ask for your approval. Uh, we have several considerations that we will look at, the campus capacities, uh, we'll take a look at the input, uh, we'll look at demographic factors, history, the other locations of boundaries, roads, all those kinds of things uh, where we think we might have a next school. Uh, so and we, we really, at this point, we think our next school will likely be in the 242 corridor, so we'll be mindful of that as we do our planning. Um, you know, we're in the process of really kind of solidifying our plans uh, because we are in a new time. Um, we are planning to have some virtual meetings. We probably won't go out and do a bunch of physical meetings, but we'll probably plan to have virtual meetings. We'll do a lot on the web page as we've done in the past. Um, regardless of how we end up doing this, uh, we know we're going to have to move students to, to achieve these goals, but our commitment is to provide a quality education experience at whatever school our students attend. And as I mentioned, we would plan to give you an update in November and then be back uh, in January with a formal recommendation. Thank you, sir. Uh, I have one in question. If I yes, sir. Um, you mentioned opening with 95. Is that the anticipated um, opening population, or is that the building capacity that 9015? 
we do not anticipate opening that large. Um, I think our, you know we want to leave some room for growth. Yeah. And so I just wasn't sure yeah, from that first slide. It, what that it, and I didn't mention it, but you know one of the things on I had the Grangerland numbers up there, and we wanted to include the intermediate in the planning because in 2023 when we open the junior high that will replace Moorhead Junior High, uh, which will be larger, we plan to turn Moorhead Junior High into an intermediate. So we'll have an intermediate coming online in 2023. So we're trying to be mindful of that process, and so we hope. You know, what I what I anticipate might happen is we might have two elementaries that will feed one intermediate, two that feed another, and maybe one that splits between the two. So we're just trying to work through it, uh, being as mindful as the, of the future as possible. I don't see it being full when we open. Thank you, Doctor Hines. Outstanding job. Lots of work. All right, item. Six. Oh, before we go any further, I want to, on behalf of the board, I want to make sure we acknowledge the most gracious and and uh, considerate ladies of TSTA Conroe for providing us with dinner this evening. Yeah. Delicious and nutritious. We appreciate you, ladies. <laughs> Thanks again. Great cooks. I was or thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you. Really appreciate all that you guys do. Appreciate you. All right, uh, item six, planning and construction. Consider acceptance of Austin Elementary additions and renovations construction project. Mr. Foster. Easy. We want easy. Good evening, President Williams, members of the board, and Dr. Null. It's my pleasure to bring forward for your consideration and approval. And acceptance is complete the Austin Elementary uh, additions and renovations project, which Dr. Hines alluded to just a moment ago. Uh, so a little over a year ago, we finished it, uh, finished that project where we opened, uh, redu removed the uh, oldest portions of that building from their from service because they'd reached the end of their useful life. And then added on to that campus so that we didn't increase the capacity, but we did create a new, uh, new building uh, for them to have another, you know, 50 year run in that location. So uh, after going through the uh, financial documents with the contractor, we're happy to report that we're returning unspent allowances and savings of $290,982.78 on a little over an $18.2 million contract. So at this time, we request your approval. So moved. Second. How much was this, uh, you're returning back? $290? 290 yes. Outstanding, man. So we have a motion, second. Any discussion other than that? All right, all in favor? Great job. Thank you. All right, item uh, B, consider and approve uh, G701, was this change order for guaranteed maximum price amendment to Conroe High School renovation project and delegate authority superintendent to execute contracts. All right, for this item, I'm try to keep it relatively simple, uh, but we had a, a 2015 bond project at Conroe High School where we had a building addition to some renovations there, which was what we internally call phase one of a master plan. So 2019's bond has a phase two, which continues on uh, as a master plan for that uh, for that campus, so we uh, we finished phase one. I don't know. I, I don't think moment. that to me, but uh, but we finished that project about a year ago, and then just like with Austin, we went through some financial uh, paperwork with the contractor. For this particular campus, the old job was Ellisor Constructors as a CM at risk. The new bond project is also Ellisor Constructors as CM at risk. So we calculated a little over $2 million of savings off the phase one project on a, almost a $50 million contract. So it's, uh, and we want to put that money to beneficial use for Conroe High School into their phase two project. And we want to make good use of the time. So this is really more, yeah, it's not a request for extra money, so to speak. We want to use the savings and take some of the bond money from the 2019 project and apply it to the 2015 project so we can make use of the Christmas holidays and the time between now and so it's we, a timing thing, yes, and an adjustment between bond packages <coughs> to where you're going to take the money so the, the, parts. the money we're asking for has been allocated for Connor High School for this purpose, uh, but it is a timing thing. So we, we've got uh, some work with the city that should be permitted for a, a new bus loop that's coming around the north side of that campus uh, and some electrical infrastructure that's got to be moved in order to facilitate the new building locations that we're coming up with. And then uh, over the Christmas break, we also want to uh, outfit some classrooms that are currently not being used at Connor High School for some programs that are going to be displaced because of building demolition. So we've got a welding program, we've got an engineering and architecture program, and a graphic arts program that need to be located in other classrooms within the campus. And we can do that over the Christmas holiday. They'll start the winter break in their new 
home away from home, so to speak. And then we'll bring you the big project uh, in the spring semester in January or February, depending on some planning, uh, some planning things we've got going on with that. Uh, so this change order will allow us to make effective use of the time and start and, and minimize student disruption in the spring semester. So at this time, we're going to ask you to increase the phase one contract by a little over $950,000, but it's also utilizing the savings from phase one. So moved. I second the motion. I, have one, I just have one Go question. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Husband. Let me just reiterate, you, you, $950,000 change order, but really all you're doing is taking 950 from the 2019 <clears throat> and technically not spending 950 of the new bond package money that was for Conroe High School. You're not spending more money. We're not spending more. Uh, we're just moving it from moving 20, it from one yeah. place to correct. Right. I'm good, Mr. Sanders. So my question is about: Is there a change in the scope of work? Because if you're <coughs> if you're, you have a nine hundred fifty thousand dollars change order, how are we not spending more? I'm, I'm sorry, well, I, I'm I mean, not good at math. I guess. Well, and, and it's not, and that's why I try to make it simple. Yeah. The work that we're doing is work that will be done regardless of the approval of this change order for the master plan project for the 2019 bond. So we're just using a, a contracting method because we've got the a team, a, a, the team is continuous from one contract right. to the other. Right. So we're able to use that, uh, that contracting mechanism to keep them working. So we did take a little bit of a, a little bit of our current planning time and did an early package, so to speak. So if you think back to what we did for Grand Oaks when we started that project, we started a site work package first got about two or three million dollars worth of work going right and then four or five months later brought you back the main building package right in effect that we're doing the same thing except instead of asking you to for sounds like it's being done in reverse correct and we're also able to make use of the savings that we uh, have accumulated over the course of the phase one project so it's work that was to be paid for out of the 19 bond that's being going to be paid for out of the 15 bond yes so t change orders but he has terminology. It's, it's kind terminology. Of change order is, is what's it's really right. messing me up. Correct. We're really not changing anything correct. except Time. funding source yeah. from one bond issue to another. That is correct. Yeah. That's that's change order is Scope of work is not changing. And the traditional sense right. is not a change I'm, order. I'm satisfied now. Change, change order is the thing that's messing me up. I got it. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, all in favor? Motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Foster. Mr. Foster, uh, receive capital improvement updates. All right, so for a much simpler explanation about what's going on throughout the district, uh, I'm going to give you an update on our capital improvements we have underway. We'll start with uh, Hope Elementary uh, out in the Grangerland area. So as you can see from our overhead picture, uh, that milestone we've been talking about for the last couple of months of getting the building dried in, uh, we are rapidly approaching that. So you can see the, uh, if you looked at this picture last month, the roof was a very light gray color, uh, and now it's turning black because that's the base sheet of the roofing. Uh, and you see the more CMU walls and the green uh, exterior wall framing that's going on, so that, that is going well. You also take note the neighborhood is coming up around us as well. Yeah. They've got over 100 homes uh, up out there now with people living in those some of those homes currently. So getting down on the ground level, you see more more detail. The front door of this building is coming together. Uh, you see a big old stack of block as they're starting to build the classrooms and things of that nature out of the uh, interior walls. And on the inside, you start seeing the building systems. So the things that, are, that make the building tick are coming together. So we're happy to report it is on schedule, scheduled to open in August of 2021. Now at Runyon Elementary, we've got a PE classroom additions project. So, and it's also got some uh, pre-K classrooms that are coming uh, online too, because as we negotiate around that campus and start moving some students around within that building, uh, what you're seeing here is the structure for the, uh, what will be some new art classrooms, new uh, pre-K classrooms. Uh, the other structure is the uh, dedicated gymnasium space, which will be joined to the main building by a space that will become uh, the new library for that campus. Uh, the library inside that building is currently inside mm -hmm. some old classrooms. Mm -hmm. And once we get the structures up, they're anticipated to be turned over for our use uh, for the uh, right after the winter break for the spring semester. And that'll allow us to get inside that building and return the current library to classroom space and the current pre-K uh, spaces to some life skills classrooms that are needed on that campus. So it is, it is on schedule and proceeding just as we'd hoped. At York Junior High, where we're increasing the overall capacity of uh, York Junior High, so you can see on the top portion of the building, 
here you see the foundation coming in uh, for the uh, academic section. So the classrooms, uh, art, art and science labs, uh, not art, but science labs and, and, and academic classrooms. They're working their way uh, towards us in the, in the picture to the foreground as they're doing the building foundations and slabs. Mm -hmm. Structural steel is set to arrive in October and then that project will be going vertical. And it is scheduled to uh, be complete for our use in August of 2021. At the Woodlands College Park High School, where we're doing a building addition to help us reduce our reliance on portables. Uh, that, much like York, is in the building uh, foundation section. So grade beams, building slab is uh, the next step. And then the structural steel set to arrive in the next uh, couple of weeks. And then that building will start going vertical as well. It is also on schedule. Uh, with some complexities here, the, uh, the schedule uh, was originally uh, set to turn over at the winter break of 21. Uh, and the uh, contractor believes they can beat that date, so we're trying to work on a, a, a legitimate schedule that gets them to an August completion date so we don't have a mid-semester uh, mid turnover. At the Woodlands High School, uh, where we're, again, doing a building project to get uh, uh, reduce our use of portables on that campus, you can see it is scheduled for a completion of August of 21, so it's slightly ahead of uh, where College Park is, the building slab and the structural steel is there, so it's going vertical. Uh, so that project is on schedule, uh, like I said, scheduled to open in August of 21. And then our safety and security project, which is, again, it's hard to see what's going on. Most of it is above the ceiling and in the walls, things of that nature. But you're looking at some new equipment uh, installed in one of our elementary schools where the, the exit alarms and the entrance alarms that are going on all the unsecure areas. So we call secure the backyard where it's fully fenced. So the unsecure areas which would walk out to the parking lots or the streets or roads in front of the campuses. So one of the features of these now is the campus is outfitted with an alarm. So if somebody uh, does not have access to that campus, comes in or goes out without credentials, then the front office is uh, notified and the, the camera image of that door that was breached, so to speak, uh, appears on that monitor that's on the wall up there. So those projects are, are wrapping up nicely. They're going to finish at the end of October, and then we'll run through some financial uh, close out information for 2020 and then we'll bring you the 2021 installment uh, in the January February time frame uh, in the spring semester and then that is our update a question for you mr. Foster yes sir um, are you seeing an increase in building material right now and do you see that affecting any of the budgeting for the projects we've got going on right now well I can I can tell you for the next uh, six months I mean if you and if you'll recall when we were uh, doing our bond planning I get uh, the privilege to participate on the industry committee for our whole region. So we, we study uh, cost for educational projects in particular uh, often. I mean, so the, uh, the report that our, our committee uh, just published here recently uh, had some data that actually says the next six months are going to be very good for pricing. So with the bids we're seeing come through in other districts and other locations, even outside of education, are very favorable towards us, the, the owner. So there are some individual material upticks, and there always are, but mm -hmm. labor and backlog and uh, scarcity of work in general in the private sector is driving competition and, and uh, prices in the public sector uh, down. So we feel like for the schedule we've got coming up, and we're going to have a lot. I mean, we're going to get busy in the fall. Uh, mm -hmm. So we have a lot of projects coming, uh, going to advertise for bids in October for November, December, January bids, uh, and we feel like we're hitting the market at uh, what we what we think is the sweet spot so we should be able to get uh, some favorable pricing uh, and our the pre-planning we're doing is starting to return some of those uh, same conversations so it's not just my word we're talking to other contractors and other other districts about what they're That's seeing good. as well because I have seen uh, that lumber has gone up dramatically like 30 percent yeah and, I, mean, uh, I, I didn't know if, if, if that meant across the board for every no, I mean, lumber is a, is a particular, it's a commodity anyway, but we're also in hurricane season, having just had a hurricane mm -hmm. uh, with uh, some of the plants, some of the big lumber mills have been on a reduced capacity already because of COVID-19. Uh, I mean, so I, the, the lumber increase is, is cyclical, and we're in one of the high periods anyway. It is higher than we would normally anticipate. But the good news is, is we don't use a whole lot of lumber in right. education. I noticed that. Uh, we use some, but it's not. It doesn't actually move the needle on a on a Very 25 good. million, 26 million dollar job. Thank you. I have a similar question on the long lead items. Are we seeing um, delays or anticipating any delays? I'm seeing that in other sectors of commercial construction, where those long lead items are getting even longer based on uh, manufacturing stoppages. 
Well, and, and we've experienced some of that. So if you'll recall our update a couple months ago for Washington Junior High in particular, it was a late start in our bidding schedule and it was early finish because it was uh, had to get it done over the summer. And we had some door frames and hardware issues at that campus uh, that they were anticipated to not be an issue. And then we got into some factory uh, issues, uh, but we ended up getting those things so that we get that campus turned over on time. Um, but that was about the extent of it. So the longer lead projects, so like Pope Elementary, for example, those orders are already six, eight, 12, 16 weeks out anyway. Uh, so we're able to anticipate some of those things coming up as we're bidding jobs. So we've got coming up Connor High School, the new junior high in Candy Creek, Oak Ridge High School, Creighton Elementary, our campus renovations next year. Uh, the one thing we haven't been able to get a, a real good beat on uh, and we don't have much to do about is our safety and security components cameras and switches things like that uh, but those aren't critical to opening the opening the building for their use uh, and we're ordering a bunch of them for our safety and security project but even with some of those we were able to finish like our 2020 project is finishing a month month and a half early uh, so we're able to uh, work with the system so to speak I don't want to say we're we're good at what we do, but we're hopefully anticipating uh, according to what the market's telling us. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Foster. No problem. Thank y'all. Item 7, Finance, consider award of RFP 20-07-03 HVAC uh, refrigerant. Mr. Reeves, come on down. Today. All right, I appreciate that. <laughs> was that your family in one of those pictures? It was. I'm reading that book? Yeah. I thought so. I thought I recognized one of them. <laughs> yeah, they were in there. <laughs> Hollywood. Good evening, President Williams, members of the board, and Dr. Null. Tonight we're recommending that the board consider awarding RFP number 20-07-03 HVAC refrigerants to the attached vendors for an estimated annual expenditure of approximately $95,000. <clears throat> The request for proposal pertaining to the purchase of these refrigerants for the district for email to registered vendors through our electronic e-bidding system, advertised on our CIC purchasing website, and also two times in the courier. We had six vendors submit a response. And in this proposal, vendors were asked to offer firm unit prices for HVAC refrigerants and offer a shelf or Cadillac discount for additional similar items not listed in the line items. So pricing shall be firm for one year through September of 2021, automatically renewing annual for two additional one-year terms through September of 2023. This proposal was evaluated by the maintenance and custodial department and, evalu and reviewed by the purchasing department. Best value offers are recommended for award. Funds for these purchases are provided in the general fund and at this time we recommend your approval. So moved. A second the motion. Motion and second. Any discussion? All in favor. Motion passed. Mr. Reeves, thank you. Mr. B, thank consider you. award for RFP 20-07-02, personal protection equipment. Once again, we're recommending that the board consider awarding RFP number 20-07-02 for personal protective equipment to the vendors listed on the attached tabulation for an estimated annual expenditure of approximately a million dollars. Request for proposals pertaining to personal protective equipment were emailed to our registered vendors through our electronic e-bidding system, advertised on the district's purchasing website, and also two times in the courier. These vendors were asked to offer a percentage discount off shelf or catalog prices for various PPE items, including face masks, face shields, gloves, and other pertinent items. We had 120 vendors submit a response. Contracts with these awarded vendors will remain firm through September of 2021, automatically renewing for two additional one-year terms through September of 2023. These proposals were evaluated by the CISD Health Services Department, the CISD Operations Department, and reviewed by the Purchasing Department. Recommendations for award are noted on the list, and at this time we recommend your approval. So moved. Second. A motion properly second. Any discussion? 120. I have a question. Go ahead, Mr. Sanders. So the million dollars, though, was really not a part of our budget. Is that? No, sir. We're just, we're anticipating just any, from what we received from the state, we're in, we needed a, a bigger pool. So right. what we've run into was our state approved vendors, long lead times, not having anything. So for us, right. it's allowed us to dip into the, uh, the private sector and award more folks who say, I can get that to you tomorrow. So right, which I'm is, glad we did. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Yes, sir. The, the question I thought, though, Mr. Rice is shaking his head. I think I know the answer. Got, okay, it's so a does, part of that sorry. grant. All right, thank you. Thank you for that. I thought I saw a line item for that. All right, motion second, discussion is done. Any other questions, concerns? All right, motion. All in favor? All right, motion passes unanimously.
Thank you, Mr. Reeves. Item C, consider adopt and approve. Uh, let me get that one right. Consider adopt and set order a resolution, the 2020 ad valorem tax rate to support the 2020 2021 budget. Dr. Noll. All right, Mr. Rice. Yes, good evening, President Williams, members of the board, and Dr. Noll. It is my pleasure to recommend the Board of Trustees approve the order to adopt a 2020 tax rate of 95.25 cents for maintenance and operations and 26 cents for debt service per $100 of taxable valuation to fund the 2020-2021 official school budget. As has been presented and discussed in the three budget workshops, the one board meeting we had in July, and two public hearings, the above noted tax rates are required to fund the maintenance and operations and debt service budgets for the 2020-2021 fiscal year. The total combined tax rate of $1.2125 per $100 evaluation is 1.75 cents lower than last year's tax rate. This tax rate has also been recommended by the district level planning and decision making committee. At this time, I recommend your approval. Mr. President, I move that the property tax rate be increased by the adoption of a tax rate of 1.2125 per $100, which is effectively a 2.34% increase in the tax rate. We have a motion. I second the motion. Properly second. Discussion. If, if I could make a comment. Please. If you don't mind. Um, Trustee Inman is out this evening because he's was having some uh, COVID symptoms and couldn't pass our screener, so he did not want to be uh, come in and take the chance of causing anyone to get sick. But he did send a message, and he asked me to read it on his behalf. So if I could do that at this time. Please. Um, these are his words. I would like to thank each individual involved in preparing the budget already presented and the funding proposal that is being presented this evening. If I were here in person, I would be voting affirmatively for the 1.215 uh, tax rate for CISD. I have every confidence that this 1.75 cent rate reduction is in the best interests of students, staff, teachers, and you, the taxpayer. Thank you. All right, we'll noted, entered in the record. Um, and any further discussion? All in favor, gentlemen? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Rice. Um, item 7D, receive financial reports. Ms. Garza. And Mrs. Garza. Good evening, President Williams, members of the board, and Dr. Nall. It is my pleasure this evening to present the financial statements for the month ended August 31st, 2020. And just a note before we begin, these are preliminary statements as August 31st is our fiscal year end. Over the next several weeks, we will be performing our year end fiscal closing entries. So some of those entries are not reflected in what you see here this evening. First statement is our balance sheet. The balance sheet shows the district assets, liabilities, and fund balances. In the general fund, we have total assets of 230 million point two. In debt service, 21.6 million. In child nutrition, 3 million. And self-funded self insurance, just over 9 million. Taking a look at our closer look at our cash and investments in the general fund, we have total cash and investments of 216.2 million dollars. The largest portion of that is in our state pools of 122.9 million. Next statement is our income statement that shows the, the district's revenues and expenditures. Our revenues come from three major sources, local, state, and federal. Our expenditures here are presented by major object. As you can see in the debt service fund, we have recorded our second debt payment for the year. So total expense in the debt service fund is $102.8 million for the year. This is our local revenue um, by major category. Um, of course, in the general fund and debt service, our largest generators are tax revenue, food sales in the, in the child nutrition fund, and then premium contributions in self-funded insurance. This is our 2019 bond referendum update. We have issued to date 122.5 million of our 653.5 that was approved by the voters. So far, we have expended or encumbered 104.7, um, leaving 531.8 as an estimate to complete. Self-funded insurance, August was a um, very active month for the health plan. Total revenue of 4.1 million, total expense of 5.2. For a net loss of 1.1 million, we are at a net loss of 668,000 for the year. We will continue to monitor this as we do our closing entries for the year, and depending on where our claims accrual comes in at year end, 
Um, we are prepared to transfer from the general fund if we need to. We do have budgeted funds set aside for this very purpose, so we will continue to closely monitor that. Participation at our wellness centers is averaging 450 a month. So our investments as of August 31st, our par value is at 375.4 million. The pools are yielding 0.286. Um, our longer term investments with TCG are yielding 1.7681. Um, our combined, combined portfolio is, uh, has a WAM of 61 days. We're yielding 0 0.5806. And our benchmark, the 90-day T-bill, is at 0.113. Mm. Thank you, Ms. Carnes. Outstanding job. Any questions, concerns, gentlemen? All right. Hearing none, we're going to go to item 8, which is executive session. The closed session of the board will now be held on matters contained in the Notice for this meeting as authorized by sections 551.071, 551.072, and 551.074 of the Texas Open Meeting Act. Uh, should the board determine that any final action, final decision, or final vote is required uh, with regard to any matter considered in such closed or executive meeting or session, then such final action, final decision, or final vote shall be, be at either A, the public meeting upon reconvening of the public meeting, this public meeting, upon reconvening of this public meeting, or B, at a subsequent public meeting uh, of the board upon notice of thereof, as the board shall determine. A closed session of the board will now be held. The time is 7.25 p.m. Session, the time right now is 8.42 p.m. Uh, that being said, I'll entertain a motion to close. So moved. We have a motion to close, a second, second. all in favor? Motion, we're closed, 8.42. We're adjourned. You get that time, too.